as I write about architecture and that sort of thing. And uh, I've been asked to introduce John Passmore uh, to speak tonight. Uh, I first met John about three years ago when um, Tony Banks decided that he was going to ignore the advice of his advisors and not list uh, the pavilion at Peter Lee. And, and from my standpoint at the 20th Century Society, I thought, well, he may not be going to list it, but I think something should be done. And that's another story which I won't go into, but um, that was how I met John, which was uh, a very nice outcome. And then quite independently of, of my activities, which didn't get very far on that occasion, um, John proposed the exhibition to the AA, and it's been a very timely thing, I think, because it's brought the future of the pavilion back onto the agenda. It's brought it into focus as a unique piece of um, three-dimensional inhabitable sculpture uh, by a major artist uh, with a very interesting context, um, both in Victor Passmore's life and the story of Peter Lee as a new town. So a lot of threads come together here and they can be seen in the exhibition upstairs. Uh, and tonight John is going to tell us uh, about his father and kind of lead us into how all this happened. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, one of the reasons I'm here, actually, is because, as Alan quite rightly pointed out, uh, this, there was this project uh, about this pavilion in Peter Lee, which has been through, it's going through a number of phases. It was a pavilion designed by my father, who was rolled in <coughs> as a artistic consultant for this new town in Peter Lee around about 1954. A priori that particular period of time, uh, in about 1948, um, the whole idea, there was a new Labour Party that came into power at that point in time, and they decided to build a new town in that area. In fact, there was a chap called Peter Lee, but I can't remember much about that. So uh, they went ahead to build this town, and uh, they employed a very well-known architect at the time, a fellow called Lubetkin, who was, in fact, quite an avant-garde chap. And he came along, but his method of building really was rather sort of dynamic. He wanted to build large tower blocks and all sorts of things like that, and make it a real kind of Brasilia, really. Um, but unfortunately, because the layout, the, the, the land was rather, had potential subsistence to it because of the mining situation, he was unable to do that. So he found himself in a bit of a quandary trying to design this town without trying to be able to do what he wanted to do. So eventually he resigned. And then uh, at that particular point in time, my father, who was, uh, was been made, appointed a, a lecturer, the head of painting in Newcastle, in the university up there, and he'd been, uh, he'd, he'd had a couple of pictures up in some exhibition around that place, and the, the chap who was in charge of PG at that time, who was uh, a fellow called A.V. Williams, who was the um, managing director of the corporation, he uh, happened to see some of these pictures, which were, in effect, rather architect architonic, shall we say. They were kind of constructions, which my father, this time, was going through a phase of doing these things. And he suddenly put two and two together and thought, well, this is interesting. This bloke, he, uh, he's got some artistic sort of qualities which have a sort of link with architecture. So he asked him if he'd come along and have a meeting and get involved. And he said, well, I, I don't know much about architecture. I know a bit, sir, but I don't know much. Anyway. They rolled him in, to cut the story short, and he um, got involved, and it went from there. Now, what I would like to do is um, to show you some pictures, really, about my father's scenario, because I think this exhibition that's here is, is intended to be an architectural... Uh, it's all to do with architecture, and... Uh, but my father was really an artist, a painter, and um, this architectural thing came in as a sort of part of his curriculum, really. So I'd really like to show you some slides and take you through some early work and through into the more modern work and also via these architectural constructions that he got involved with. So I think I'll start this ball rolling by pressing what I hope is the right button. I just pressed the blue button, yes? Here we go. 
Now, this is a very early painting. My, my dad was at uh, just a school, practically. Done in, done in, uh, he was a very gifted painter, in fact, as a young man. And uh, he didn't seem to have a huge problem in, in, in painting uh, this sort of figurative kind of style work. He probably did that when he was about 18. Again, another, so he went through a number of periods of painting in the sense that he was building up a repertoire of figurative work, uh, which was gathering momentum. These were done in the 30s and very early 40s. Uh, he was born in 1908, so you can probably work out he was in his 30s at the time. But these things were beginning to occur, or late 20s. And uh, some of these pictures have gone to all sorts of different places, to museums, private collectors, and so on. Um, he had a tremendous uh, ability with drawing, and uh, there was a kind of connection through all his work, through certain kinds of what I might call an alphabet. Uh, even that pillar behind, that's my mum's a hand, the pillar behind has got those little curly uh, uh, spirals, and that, that comes through his work right up to the present, what was the present day before he died. This is a still life, done in 1941. It says, um, again, a very simple, energetic, rather peaceful little number. Again, a natural talent. He never went to school. He never did a school. A school. He wasn't a, a taught artist. He, um, his father, my grandfather, died when he was very young. And he had to leave school a little bit early, and they ran out of money and so forth because his father was a, a medic and. Uh, had a house, I think, attached to his job. And when he died, that all went, went with it. So they had to come into Hammersmith, and they worked from there. And my father got a job at the um, county hall in Westminster as a little pen-pushing uh, bureaucrat, really, and became a weekend painter, and he used to paint on the weekends. But he had a, he had a, he had a, he had a definite goal. He was a very uh, one-track guy, you know. He just concentrated on this all the time. That's a picture of my mother too from behind. She was a, they met when he, they, he she was a paint, she was a painter actually. Uh, well, she is a painter. Um, but she was a very attractive lady actually and uh, he got to know her quite quickly I suppose and uh, they got together but she also became a very useful model. And she was a very good painter. And she sort of came into the Chelsea side of London and my father came in from the sort of uh, Actually, more this area, really. The flower cellar, it's called. And we lived, actually, at some point in time, we were living at very early stages uh, in a rented house in Chiswick by the river. And these are some, uh, some pictures he did at that time. Uh, at the bottom of the river there, there was, there was the Thames, and uh, he did a, a number of uh, pictures of these areas, scenes. Same picture, I guess this one is black and white, I couldn't find a colour version of this, but um, you begin to see a slight change now, actually, when you look at these sort of pictures, there's a sort of slight more abstraction going on, I'm not concentrating so much on the uh, bits and pieces. There's some strong elements there, but it's beginning to uh, change. Oh, sorry. Oh. And the same thing with this, really. Uh, all the trees have gone, admittedly, but there's a kind of linear style there, which again comes through later on in his later work. And uh, again, in the same sort of area. This is getting almost to a pointillistic scenario. Um, elements which he, started to, he began to build up a kind of an idea of construction. Um, I think he was thinking at this time about uh, introducing new elements into drawing and painting. And uh, he was experimenting now. I think there's a pram there. I don't know. I can't remember. I think I might be in it. I 
Unfortunately, we don't have any of these pictures at home, which is a bit sad. <laughs> They've all been uh, sold on. And of course, in those days, this is probably done in about 1945, um, you know, they were, they were all bought up for little or nothing, really. But he, got, he began to quite get a big name in those days. Um, in London, he was quite well known. He belonged to a number of different groups amongst artists and so forth. It was definitely avant-garde, an avant-garde scenario. This is done in about 1949, because I recognize this is, we've moved from Chiswick here, and we're now in a place called Blackheath. And that's looking outside of his back of his studio, and that's a studio window. So he's actually using that window as part of the construction of the whole painting. Again, it should be in color, but I haven't got a color edition of that. And now these, uh, well, the abstraction thing is now coming in now. He's beginning to take charge and getting used to the idea of creating new, using these elements for, them, for themselves, really. I was showing those spirals are coming through here for a different reason. He had a name for this particular picture, but he decided to uh, also call it an abstract name, like um, Meridian Blue, Crimson, and so forth. I can't remember the exact name of the picture at the moment, but it has a narrative name, but it also has a name which is based on its colors and its shapes and its forms, which is quite important, really, because he began to consider the picture in terms of pure color and pure line. And he was not particularly interested in any subject much at this time. I mean, the picture, in fact, might well have been called the snowstorm, or it's one of those ones, actually, but it's not really anything to do with the snowstorm. It's really a, something that's come purely from inside. This is, I would consider, to be a total abs abstraction of a fairly simple still life. But it's left at that point. He's finished it, although it's unfinished, in a sense. As far as he's concerned, it's entirely finished. And it really is uh, beginning to show this the canvas is beginning to be that the picture plane is, is actually part of the subject at the same time. There's no real reason to uh, differentiate between the picture plane and the subject. They are one and the same. I think probably a little bit of uh, influence by uh, Paul Clay here, he was very interested in uh, looking out to see what was going on around him and uh, he read a number of books about Clay, I think. Um, I had seen one or two things, Picasso's, and was beginning to think uh, totally abstract, you know, more concrete in terms of this. So we've gone from a figurative element figure a situation quite quickly into this abstract movement within a very few years. This is what they'd call a collage, which is um, sticking bits of paper and so forth, creating a, a situation there. Um, I really like these, they're terrific actually. Uh, and probably if you read the text on the paper, I don't think he would have a... He, was, he wasn't politically minded, but he might have put one or two things like the local cricket score on it or something like that. I don't know, but... Even at this stage, you see, he's beginning to build up, as I mentioned earlier on, a kind of an alphabet of shapes and lines which re recur over the years. So, you know, you, you have a shape, it could be a kind of a shape of a D, or it could be a squirrel, or it could be a square, or an off square, or a round. And he dropped these elements into all his pictures. So, although they were, they, they, they were, they were art, concrete pictures, they weren't illustrating anything, he was able to fiddle around with these various shapes and so forth, uh, like a composer would in music.
Now, I think I've got a picture here, which actually is a much more modern version of this last one. I mean, there's a what, painting done about 1949, 50. And this one here is probably done about 1960, 7, 65, using the same kind of elements. And there again, another one based on this flowing lines. You can see some black lines actually on these pictures. There's a big mural on the back there, which is painted on the wall. And there's some black lines on the top of it and some black lines at the bottom. And this particular picture here, there's a black line down the left-hand side. And these really are put down there to create a kind of a, uh, a sort of a stress, a sort of a strong uh, um, statement really, so it's to set the thing off, one without the other. You need, one without the other becomes rather thin. Put the two together, you get a dynamic. And he was quite interested in creating that kind of dynamic. And that happens in a lot of his work. Basically, what he's doing, in a sense, is that actually there's a picture in the middle there, and there's the lines on so-called the background. But the background isn't really the background. It's part of the picture. So everything within the frame itself is, is the picture. Oh, is that one? I'll just go back a second. Let's check where I am here. All right. Next one. That's it, is it? Okay, doesn't matter. Now here's a situation he's beginning to experiment. I mean, he was turning his studio into a kind of a laboratory, really. It became a very much, uh, it was still an artist's studio, but it was very much a, a studio of experiment, experimentation. And he was going through a phase of trying to discover how he could push the boat out in painting. Because he'd, get, he'd given up all this business of um, doing uh, nudes and portraits and figure developments and so forth. He's now going into a completely abstract, concrete world of painting. And he decided to uh, take on a course of experimenting with a changing situation, a changing uh, way of seeing work, you know. Because he would consider that in a traditional painting, you only see it from one angle. But he wanted to be able to walk across his pictures and change in the process. And he, he created this sort of uh, kind of collection of these what he called constructions, done in the very late 50s, early, very early 60s. Um, and these are the very things, these are the things that in fact were noticed by these chaps in Peter Lee uh, in the middle of the 50s. Some of these are terrific, I love them actually. They really are kind of dynamic things. Um, and it, he'd taken up teaching at this time. He was already in Newcastle teaching students. And uh, he had this idea, this basic design course, almost Bauhaus type of thing. And uh, he was getting into playing around with these shapes and, 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 and things. And, so, and some of them in color and some of them in black and white. Haphazard, I think that's, uh, he must have taken that photograph, I don't know, he is. Uh, first specs was used a lot, and he made a few of them himself, but he also had a friend, a chap he knew, who could help him out, because he wasn't a, a very clever carpenter, but uh, he could string a few of these things together. And of course, the light was very important, you know, when it could be lit from one side or the other side, and it created a different kind of feeling. So they're very movable. That's a very simple sort of a statement to look at in a sense, it's lovely.
The sense of proportion, of course, had to come in, balance and everything, so that the, the way they designed the, he designed these things, you know, he could create this differential between the background or the, or the, or the uh, picture plane and the colors and offset them on perspex to uh, create you know, new images. So there was a great balance involved. He used to hold a mirror to these things to make sure they worked both ways around. If the balance was right, he was quite happy at that point. This is another construction on a curvilinear background. It sweeps around. It's probably about three, four foot long, that. Um, the idea is you can move around inside these shapes. Not physically, but you use your imagination, and the thing is always moving around in your imagination and in reality. It's not impossible to hang these things upside down as it happens. Um, it's happened on a number of occasions. Um, they have been reproduced. And it's hardly surprising. I did go into a show the other day, actually, and they had three, three, uh, three of these constructions. This is a show in, 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 in Cork Street. And um, I looked at these pictures, and I hadn't seen them for quite a while. There was somebody else's collection, and I just thought I hadn't seen one of these pictures before. And I sort of tilted my head at some point in time, and I went back in, and sure enough, I realized they'd hung it the wrong way around. So, you know, it's fair enough as far as they're concerned, but they should know, I thought, because it was a gallery. <laughs> So that's now taking us into the reason really why he was called into Peter Lee. Based on, the, on those last pictures you've seen and those constructions, he was brought in. And one of the things he did there, this is just simply one of his pieces actually, which is not a, a, an architectural piece. Um, it's simply a, a kind of an art uh, barrier. It's a, a fence or a, a sort of design fence uh, which was placed there in the, in the, in the town. So if you can see some of those previous constructions, you can begin to see one or two shapes that are coming in here as well, even with the housing. And they had all these flat roofs in those days, which, were, um, which was difficult in many ways, because, but this is what he wanted. Um, because their construction ability in the very early 50s was was slightly rushed I believe and um, they were unable to be solid in terms of water you know, so they did actually leak on occasions so the idea was there that the mechanics wasn't a hundred percent but definitely a kind of a cubist cubistic shape very architonic no dressing as such, really. So he was asked to actually, you know, in a sense, he's responsible in, in, his, you know, in his mind to design some of these places and also to design the layout for where these buildings stood. There was a time whereby when he first went there, um, they had a string of roads and all the houses were attached to the roads as was normally the case. And he found that rather restricting. So later on in his project, he actually isolated the houses away from the roads. So the roads, the roads had a freeway. The roads had their own sort of lattice work, and the houses were dotted in amongst them, rather than a, a ribbon of housing, which you, you associate with early 30s uh, developments. Also very conscious, of course, at those times, and they still are today, I guess, is about, you know, the environment not being 
sort of bulldozed by this building. So the environment, in a sense, this was designed to work with the environment. And trees, were, uh, which were already there, the houses were built around the trees rather than the trees planted afterwards. I mean, they actually built the houses, taking into consideration the um, surroundings. That's my dad there, he's filming it. I think we were, we were doing a little film at that time. In fact, we did a film together, um, which we edited together. Uh, so the whole film, in fact, is about his painting and everything. And the Peter Lee, which we have a copy of, but we can't show it here because the, um, they haven't got a projector for it. But that was my fault, because I didn't actually uh, work that one out straight away. Well, unfortunately now, because all these little houses have now got pent roofs on, because um, I think after uh, some of them went for sale and so forth, and the private people who owned them realized that some of them did leak, and they decided to build little sort of pent roofs. And in, to my way of thinking now, it now looks a bit like a sort of a Lego land in a funny sort of way. This is the uh, part of this um, pavilion he bought. He, 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 I, think, I don't know if you've been to the exhibition upstairs, but this is what it's all about, mainly. Uh, as this pavilion he uh, constructed, he was asked to put a building <coughs> towards the end of his services at this place. He was asked to, to put a building as a focal point or something in a focal point at the end of a lake. And uh, so he came up with some plan. And um, he'd been working previously uh, for a competition and had dreamt up, in fact, had designed an abstract architectonic piece of pure sculpture with no particular utilitarian purposes. And uh, he, this never went through in the initial stages, so he sort of regurgitated it in a sense and um, used it as a sort of basis to, to, to create this new model. And they uh, went ahead and did it, and to his he was very concerned about the idea, well not concerned, but he fortunately met a very good engineer. And these days, um, pre-reinforced pre or reinforced concrete was quite new. So they could cantilever great slabs of concrete over the lake and so forth. He was able to do that. So it was quite an architectural feat, really. And that's um, a part of it. There's the buildings to the left. And it comes right across this waterway and of course he had to put a mural on it because he felt like he needed to do that and it was um, in contrast to the actual hard linear shapes he's, he's created this sort of more fluid fluid mural the actual piece of sculpture at the front actually I think of this one yeah, that was actually mine I did that he asked me if I could do a bit of sculpture to fit in I was trained as a sculptor so I said, okay, Pop, so I went and did that. <laughs> in fact, they had two of them. There was one in the middle of the town. Um, yeah, there's another one I did, which is in the middle of the town at Peterley there. I think it's been knocked over now, and they've swept it aside. But the one by the lake is still there. That seems to be an accident of uh, double exposure, but I thought it was quite fun. He'd done a number of commissions, and this was a commission um, done in 1951, during the Festival of Britain, 51, 52, for the side of a restaurant place near Waterloo Bridge. That's very big, that place, and uh, he got the commission to do that. And therefore, at that time, he got involved with some architects, in fact, which gave him 
some sort of method of being able to speak to these people in Peter Lee. He had been involved with architects previously. And this is a commission he did, uh, a mural in another building. Again, working alongside, uh, alongside the architects and the engineers. He had to work within certain constraints. This is another piece he did. I think that's him in the process of measuring up. I think he's, built, he's drawing one of those lines up there. I don't think he was satisfied with the lines actually on the pictures, so he decided to draw a line even higher. So in other words, he's expanded the picture. This is another mural. And also at one time he got involved with some of these mobiles, which were really rather, rather exciting. And this, was, this, this is quite early on actually, but he got two or three commissions to put these, these mobiles. This is in a school. And these mobiles swing around and uh, they, from different angles and so forth, they create different feelings as you walk around them or they can spin in front of you. But once again, involved with architecture. This is taking uh, a construction to stage further, really. This is a piece of perspex with wood going virtually through. Wood is being screwed onto one side and goes straight through the other side. So you can view it from both sides. It's what he calls sort of a hanging construction. And there it is in a different context. He had a retrospective exhibition at the Tate Gallery in 1965. Um, and uh, this was quite a big thing for him to do. And uh, as he would do, he decided to paint a mural and he decided to paint on the wall. But they actually, they, they, they decided they couldn't paint on the walls. So they stretched a huge muslin across the whole thing. And he got his aerosol. He got into the spraying with aerosols. I mean, the paintbrush had died, died a natural death about 1945. But Anything that came to hand, aerosols and all sorts of things, um, dripping paint and ink. And he would use these things as far as he could, to as far as much as he could. A bit later on, probably around about 1975, something like that. This is actually in a, in a courtyard. He moved, they moved, my parents moved to Malta. Um, they spent quite a lot of time in Malta. Um, he didn't have to live in London at the end of the day. Um, so he chose to, to go, they chose to go to Malta. In fact, um, my mother was looking for a place because she thought she'd have a, a holiday home for uh, two weeks or three weeks of a year. And um, they tried one or two places. And um, when he went to the Venice Biennale earlier on, somebody said, well, why don't you try Malta? 
Um, I think my dad did say, I think he actually did say, he says, where is that? You know, anyway, eventually he got down there and as soon as he landed there, he loved it because they had, again, they had all these sort of cubic houses, cubist houses, sort of Arab houses, which are fantastic, and he loved it. So he, they, they stayed on. And then the whole thing went into a kind of upside down because rather than being two weeks there and the rest of the time back home in London, they, my mother got involved with lots of animals and God knows what feeding stray cats and stray dogs. They ended up, they were sort of 50 weeks in uh, Malta and two weeks in London. It's quite odd. But I often wonder myself, actually, if he hadn't done that, as to how much he would have been infected by the, um, the sort of zeitgeist of, of London. I mean, he was quite a long way away. He was, he was informed, he, 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 did, he did a lot of letter writing and so forth. Um, but I often wonder whether if he'd stayed in London, whether he would have, um, in theory, his work would have progressed at the same rate and in theory the same way. Um, the things that, that might have changed might have been a certain sense of colour might have changed. But I don't think his intentions in terms of his construct would have changed. That would have remained the same wherever he lived. Uh, I think the only thing that would have changed his work slightly would have been a sort of sub subliminal um, Colour might have changed because obviously in Malta there was a lot of sunlight, a lot of blue, a lot of green, a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of white. I think that may have indirectly affected him, but that would have been the only thing. This is quite nice to film, actually. I think we were filming this, and uh, in fact, we rolled it up, and then we put the camera on a very high speed, and then let it go, so it unraveled, and because in the film, it's quite nice, because it sort of reveals itself quite slowly. He called this um, Apollo, um, really, at the time that the, the Apollo lunar missions were, were running, and uh, he wanted this kind of upward feeling, um, Sort of aspirations and so forth. You know, he called it Apollo. There's a bigger version. And that picture, actually, which is really quite long, as you can probably imagine, ended up in the um, Museum of Modern Art in Queensland in Australia. Um, they had to bend it at the top so that it came off from the ground. And then went across the ceiling, which is quite nice. I've only seen a photograph of it, but it looked quite nice in, in, in that photograph. So it was quite a dynamic, tactile thing. And my dad was never really worried about, he was never precious about his work. I've got a film, and he's got, he's got two dogs are running all over it. He's walking all over it. And uh, paint's getting a bit smudged, but he never worried about that. You know, he was, never, he was never really precious about things. If you looked at some of the stuff earlier on, there's quite a lot of crude work involved. But it's the, the whole feeling of doing it that was important, I think. This shows an example of um, when he used to pour paint or ink onto a canvas or a sheet of paper and he took the paper. And there was a certain amount of control, a lot of it's by accident. And uh, you could play around like that, which is another kind of a method of painting, really. This is a picture he did. He would do it on a canvas, and eventually they'd mount it up and send it back to England, um, possibly for a show. Um, he used to have a show roughly about once every two years. Uh, he had a, an agency, an agent, and um, for a particular deal, they would um, they would put up two shows, one, one every two years, I think it was. Um, so they would be responsible for finishing it off, although he would tell them how he wanted it and so forth. That would be around about eight foot long.
And that wall behind, in fact, was a wall that he had built. Because um, when he first purchased his farmhouse in Malta, it, most of the farmhouse was built like that. Um, and he built about three or four large courtyards, and he carried that method through all the way. It's all dry, dry stone building. It's fabulous to look at, actually. I think throughout all the world, there's a huge variety. I mean, it's, it's um, although there is a very a tremendous uh, variety, I've been told, and I, I know it to be true, that it's very easy to recognize a Victor picture um, if, you're in, if you're in the business of art and so forth, in, anything to do with art. His work is really recognizable despite the variations. It's quite extraordinary. There's always something that links each and every one together. I think this is the last picture here. This is actually a, it's not a very good picture. I wish I'd be able to show some more of these, but he, I mean, he multi built himself a, well, they were going, they were actually building a cesspit. And it got so big that at the end of the day, they thought, Christ, you know, um, so he suddenly thought it might as well turn, <laughs> turn into a swimming bath. So they built the swimming bath and they created that. And he, he made a bit of a job of it, actually. It was quite exciting. Um, unfortunately, I just can't find the other pictures, but there's a line which you can just see going up the wall, which has been taken off. We put it back again, but it goes right down from the top of the wall, it goes along and it goes down into the swimming, bar, into the swimming pool along the bottom of the pool. And about two thirds of the way along the bottom of the pool, it sort of ends with a big round dot. So it's really rather fun, actually, it's really nice. It's a kind of an environmental, the whole thing is an environmental piece. Um, so at the end of the day, his painting never relied on the picture plane, the flat plane. It was something that you, was, in the end of the day, it was a mixture of painting, sculpture, and architecture. Well, that's the slides. Do you want to turn a few lights on? Or? Let's check that. I think it is. Yeah. So, um, what I'd like to say, just, you know, uh, I was very lucky to get the, you know, the, the been given this chance to do this, uh, put this program on at this place here at the, at the association. I'm really grateful to your chairman, Moisson. I'm very uh, grateful for the help of people like the curator, Vanessa. I'm very grateful for the help of Matt, who's on the administrative side, and all their people. And uh, I've met a lot of people through the process of doing this. And there's all sorts of things I could talk about, actually, in spin-offs, but I just think maybe perhaps you might want to ask some questions, or maybe Alan would like to say something. What should we do, Alan? Um, well, uh, you said just what I was going to say about uh, some questions. I, I thank you very much, first of all, for ah, that's right. uh, mm. very nice, uh, low-key, but I think very revealing presentation. Unfortunately, very low-key. I, I just get a bit low-key in these situations. Well, I think it's absolutely right. Uh, the, the work speaks for itself <laughs> very well, and you added just what was needed, I think, so it was lovely oh, to right. see that, and thank you very much. But, um, yes, uh, anybody who'd like to ask anything, um, we can um, see where we get to. people had bright orange curtains and these were pink and it looked quite fantastic like people had taken over the housing well you see when this building when, they, when, they, when this thing was first done built up um, uh, 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 well people could do what they like with their own houses inside obviously you know you can put up Our architects are notoriously kind of horrified I think aren't they by kind of people putting up curtains above sort of yeah I don't suppose he would have particularly worried about that I mean his main concern was well, he wouldn't have voiced his worry about that, I mean, because once his job was done, in a sense, it was done. Um, so what you did to the inside of the building was really rather, that wouldn't have come through very strongly, I don't think. Um, but the reason I've actually shown you all these paintings is that when I came to do this talk, I, I wasn't quite sure who my people were going to be I'm talking to. And you are an, arch an architectural college, apart from the association. 
And I thought, well, I just don't know enough about architecture to get into a complete deep end of architecture. I might be riddled with questions which I wouldn't be able to respond to. So I just thought I'd take you through this whole scenario of the, of the chap and his work to give it a much broader scenario for which you can then see how it works in the exhibition upstairs, how it sort of folds in. But I can take some more questions, or Alan can take some more questions if you like, if you've got any. Well, I don't, th I mean, I think the later modif modifications are, are slightly sad, actually, to say the truth, because the initial concept was done at that particular time. And I think cha things have changed. Uh, I mean, see, originally, when the uh, corporation were in charge, they were quite an ongoing, forceful enterprise. And when I think the, the Labour Party was swung out and, and Thatcher came in, um, the corporation folded and everything went into the hands of the local councils. Well, unfortunately, the local councils didn't have a lot of money. And uh, so they couldn't really afford to maintain the sort of momentum that had been going on previously. And I think the sad thing, of course, was that the buildings, not all the buildings, but some of them, and the, and the, the pavilion anyway, began to run down to seed. And it was then that the local people got rather fed up. Um, so it was one thing on top of another. Um, and also, I think the thing has gone into, um, I mean, the, the, I've been up there, the actual pavilion looks terrific in many ways. I just said to one person, I think, you know, well, you need a lick of paint, it would look great, but the point is a bit more than that. And I think potentially it's very possible that it was probably put slightly to, I mean, the housing came from both sides of the lake. And the idea, Dad had the idea, he wanted to link the housing across the lake. There was one kind of a linkage, all architect, architect, architecturally kind of organized. But of course, now we're housing either side, and now I've got these little penthouse tops, pent roofs, you see. And um, that's made it a little bit more of a freestanding sculpture rather than a, an original connection. So the, if they did actually manage to retain the, the situation and put it in place, it would have a, it would be, uh, it would playing a different, slightly different part. It would become a, you know, a unique symbol of that particular period and more of a sculpture than its original uh, take, I think. What, for it to be um, re reborn? Well, I just keep my fingers crossed, really. I think it's difficult. I can understand the problems. I mean, everyone can. But, I mean, there is, it's a very serious, it was a very serious effort, this thing. There was no, and it was a serious piece of work. And um, I think people need to be educated in this area. I mean, it's, very, it's, it's understandable, of course, you live next door to certain things, you don't like them. You do have a problem. But I think that the overall situation is a very important piece of work. It's a, it's a grand piece of work. And if it was, re it, was, it was reinstated and so forth, I think it would look terrific. I think it needs to be put onto a, a bigger agenda. Peter Lee is slightly off the beaten track, but Peter Lee will advertise itself like heck, and it's actually expanding. So, I mean, there's plenty of... In fact, if it wasn't for people like Williams in those earlier days, I mean, they wouldn't have got these sort of um, public monuments of art. Most of them are lingering around the Northeast because of the, um, not just lottery money, but the vision of some of these people. Without that, they wouldn't have had anything around there. But you, you know, you get some good ones and you get some bad ones, and I think this is a good one. Yeah, I, I think that the steps, um, yeah, I think the, the object of the exercise initially was that you could use it as a kind of a thoroughfare underneath or on the top, so you could walk through it or you could walk underneath it. But I don't think that they realized at the time a lot of kids were prepared to do that as well. So it became a little dangerous, actually. If you, if, if you, when you get up the stairs, you know, a young child could fall off, actually. There's no question about that. So it was very difficult, and I think that the local council decided to take the ste steps away in order that there were any accidents. I think that's the reason they took them away. Well, I, I think the, uh, I think probably the buildings put up there, I don't think the steps were, the steps were probably put in there by the, the corporation. They thought, well, we know, we've got to make this accessible. Um, and they are a kind of an ad hoc 
situation. They don't, they kind of belong, but they don't belong, you know. I mean, the step, when they're not there, it looks better without them. But uh, I don't think it detracts from the fact they're not there. Yes, I, I think it's, it's true to say that you are supposed to be able to walk through that. Yeah, path. yes, and yes. It's a shame yeah. not be able to do that. As I understand it, in order to get the funding for it, you couldn't call it art. I mean, this is a common situation with trying to put art into architectural projects. You have to call it landscape or something else. Mm. So in this case, it was called a bridge. Uh, as though you needed it to get across the water, which in reality you don't. Yeah, yeah, um, that's right. So that was one reason. And the steps always looked rather perfunctory, as mm, though they were mm. a bit stuck on, which was a shame. Sure. Um, mm. And in the end, it gave the pretext for not listing it, the fact that they'd be taken away, which was also a shame. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to go through a scenario here to see whether we can retain this building or whether in the end of the day the... Um, the local people win. Well, it, it sort of has mass on its side. Is it, is mm. it going to be quite an effort physically to remove it? Well, a lot of people do actually like it as well. It's not the reason to do actually like it. I think by detracting the steps from the problems, it does take a lot of what the building is about. No, well, that's, uh, but there's no reason why it should. That's right, yeah, that's right. It's very understandable, yeah. That's right, yes, I agree with that. Yeah. To know that. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I have a feeling, I don't know, Paul, we were at a meeting that was held within the last month or so. Yes, there was a meeting a couple of weeks ago at the Leeds <laughs> University um, with um, officers from the council who said they were going to walk to the council home for the next two days um, and something was going to come out of that. And there was a meeting next month uh, when apparently some speakers 
you're laughing, then up. It looks, uh, it doesn't look, you, you can't raise yourself to it, you know. So I don't, I think the easiest way to go is to convince people in the area, or to help people in the area, to fend down this right, right, resilient. Yeah. I think I take, it, I take your point, you're quite right, yeah. There is talk of this show going up to Peter Lee, or that was my reason, I'm actually trying to convince Peter Lee, somebody, something happened there. There are architects in the area, there are just 60 people as well. Well, can I suggest that we move out to the bar for a second place? Okay, well, thanks, yeah.